Hello, welcome back from the break. Um, we know you like the networking opportunities and there will be a little bit more later on. So, um, but bear with us. We're going from the last panel discussion straight into this panel discussion, which is very similar. And uh, we hope this panel will, t will tell us what the future will bring, of course. The uh, panel is entitled The Road Ahead for Bankers and Policymakers. Let me introduce the moderator, Patrick Jenkins, deputy editor of the Financial Times. And Patrick will introduce the uh, panelists. Over to you. Thank you, Connie. Um, well, th thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, it's great to see so many uh, familiar faces. Um, yeah, uh, very uh, pleased to have the panel that we've got here. Um, a great mix of uh, 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 revered figures from across banking and uh, politics and regulation. Uh, on the far side, we have uh, Frank Ellison, uh, the vice chair of the supervisory board at the European Central Bank. Uh, next to him, we have Thomas Serenheimer, Chairman of the Economic and Financial Committee of the Council of the European Union. Uh, Christian Seving is uh, CEO of Deutsche Bank and also President of the European Banking Federation. Uh, uh, Irena Tinali uh, is Chair of the Committee on Economic and Monetary Affairs of the European Parliament. And Sam Woods, uh, Deputy Governor for Prudential, Prudential Regulation at the Bank of England. Um, thank you all very much for being here. Um, as Connie said, uh, the, the, the kind of uh, the theme for this panel is uh, what the future holds, the road ahead, uh, both from a banking and policymaking point of view. So there's there's a broad uh, a broad spread of things that we could and should talk about. Um, I want to pick up on a few of the themes that were touched on, uh, perhaps uh, in a bit more detail um, from the from the previous panel, um, and maybe start off with. Uh, a kind of this valuation point, because I do think it's crucial for European banks. Um, I was talking to a, a consultant the other day who pointed out that 85% of Europe's banks are now trading below book value. Uh, and the vast majority of those have been trading below book value for a decade. In any other sector, these banks would no longer exist. These companies would have been wound down, broken up. Uh, they don't make economic sense. But clearly, there are other factors at play here. Um, Christian, you've been running Deutsche Bank and uh, in, a, in the majority uh, in having a valuation that's below book value. Tell us your kind of perspective on why this is the case and if there's a glimmer of hope for, uh, for it changing. Well, first of all, thank you for the uh, invite. And, and yes, we also still exist and we yeah. will exist. So uh, <laughs> not to put any concerns or doubts here. Look, I think this has uh, various reasons, but, but also you, you said glimmer of hope. Um, first of all, coming from, from the lows, clearly. But if you, if you look at the um, valuation of European banks this year, also compared to other industries and also to other regions, you see that there is um, a slight turnaround. Um, nobody of us can happy with that, and it's not good enough. And you know, uh, Andrea on this wonderful dinner last night also said it. Um, we cannot be happy with that, but uh, you know, we always need to to look um, at the full story. And coming from from a time actually with zero or negative interest rates, um, with clearly some banks and. You know, Deutsche Bank was part of that, uh, not cleaning up early enough and, and being in a, in a complex situation. Um, that explains a little bit the past, um, the past valuation. Now, why is it still so and how do we get out? Um, first of all, I do believe, and I was unfortunately not part of the previous panel, but in, in such a scenario where we are living, in particular in Europe, um, investors don't like just by by category, levered industries. And, and banks are more levered uh, than others. And, and there is always, obviously, a little bit of reluctance, which we have to take into account. Secondly, um, I do believe that um, there is still a lot of concern about the economic outlook for 2024. Um, if you read all kind of forecasts now for the year 2024, um, most of the analysts are actually saying, and researchers, that they see a slight recession coming. And obviously, there are then doubts, what does it mean to the asset quality uh, of the banks? And not potentially only for commercial real estate, but also for other asset classes. Number three, um, the analysts are saying, 
And on the other hand, over 2024, interest will come down. So the good ride on NII is coming to an end. So how is the business plan and how is the business model adjusting to that? Um, and I think these three items are all kind of um, blockers, so to say, that, that, that we as banks with our business model have to convince the analysts that despite this situation, um, we, are, we are actually in a position to further increase profitability uh, and keep the momentum which we have seen in, in 2023. And not in order to take most of the time here on the first question, but I can see exactly that. Because if you really look at the world, and if I look at what Deutsche Bank can do about it, there are the geopolitical conflicts. We have the mega, uh, the mega task, but also opportunity of transformation, and we have AI. And, and I have never seen more client demand than we see currently in terms of advice, in terms of future financing needs, in terms of risk management of corporates. And therefore, the role of banks in advising corporates, private clients, with regard to the challenges which are out there, is getting bigger and bigger. So therefore, I can see where the concerns are, but I think with the solidity and the robustness we all have achieved in European banking, when I look at the balance sheets, at the capital and liquidity position, at the asset quality, the, in my view, repaired business model, now with the need of the clients actually to ask for advice, I think actually that the momentum which we see on the top line will go ahead. And if we keep the discipline, and that's what I see across Europe actually, on keeping costs under control and having solid underwriting criteria, then I do believe um, valuations will come up more and more and um, therefore I'm not concerned, but we need patience. Last but not least, one item, and I put it actually really at the last because I hate to always finger point to other items, but there is also uncertainty about European regulation. Whether when banks are earning more money, it's windfall tax or we have a, a, a discussion about minimum liquidity reserves, all that is holding some investors back and saying, we saw the dividend decision, and I'm not criticizing that, in 21, is something like that coming back if banks are earning again more next year? That is a force point which we should not completely lose. Lots to pick up on there. Um, before I move on to uh, other panelists, I just wanted to pick up with you, Christian, on, on, on this point of uh, kind of fundamental performance of the, the bank's uh, loan book and, and uh, deposit base. Um, there's this perception that the NII has peaked or is peaking um, that presumably will, um, uh, we're close to that regardless of whether we're at that point yet. But what about on the, on the loss uh, expectations? Because there does seem to be a distrust, and I think Stuart Graham on the last panel pointed this out, a distrust from investors that the kind of benign loss expectations that a lot of the banks have just not believed by the investment community. Uh, how can you convince them? Well, by quarterly, by quarterly delivery of our numbers and sticking to our targets. I think mm. you can only uh, convince investors if you say something and you stick to that. Um, mm. That's what I'm always telling my management board. If we give out a cost number or a loaner's provision guidance, um, it is really vital for us to stick to it, or if we are outside that, that we have a good explanation. Now, on the asset quality, I do believe that we see a slight deterioration in asset quality going forward, because at some point in time, the higher interest rates will have their impact. I mean, you can't negate that. But I do also think that banks have done a far better job. And I've been chief credit officer of Deutsche Bank 15 years ago. If I compare now the underwriting standards, the way we manage concentration risks, the way we, we are trying to diversify our portfolio, this is of a different quality than before. That's number one. Number two, never forget that this crisis, not crisis, I retract that, this challenging situations which we have right now is different than before. The last time that Deutsche Bank in 2002 and 2003 had very high loaners provisions was actually when the unemployment rate in Germany was a completely different one. We don't see any difference in the book of mortgaging in the consumer finance book because we have high employed uh, people. Now, if that changes, then obviously you come to a slight deterioration, 
But I would say this is a different picture than in previous cycles and therefore I'm more confident um, than previously that we can run this uh, with uh, uh, normal loss expectations. Okay. Um, Frank, let me pick up with you on w one of the points that Christian made there around the um, predictability, if you like, the stability of the uh, regulatory and, uh, and tax environment that he mentioned as well. Um, and that this seems to play a role for uh, investors, uh, particularly, I mean, it's, it's true globally, I guess. Uh, rules have been changing uh, steadily over the years. And uh, we, we heard earlier uh, that, you know, uh, maybe there needs to be further changes to the liquidity uh, regime and so on. But can you reassure investors that basically there's going to be a stable environment in terms of the rules? Um, well, first of all, uh, thanks also for having me here on the on the panel. Uh, I thought this was um, um, a, a panel on on the future. And if you ask for some reassurance that everything is going to stay be stable and not change in the you know in the in the years and decades to come, I'm going to be uh, disappointing you more more <laughs> more generally. I guess later uh, we will talk uh, maybe also about climate, and you will see that uh, things are not stable at all. Uh, but maybe you know to 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 to, um, uh, to react briefly, but uh, because I think you know lots have been said already, also in the other panel yes. on um, on valuations. But um, I think it's fair to say also from 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 our part as a, as a regulator that of course the banks, um, um, you know, when you take a little bit of a longer view and you think back to the great financial crisis, how we came out of the great financial crisis, banks of course are now. Uh, um, you know, in a much, much better state. Uh, banks are resilient, banks are, um, are well capitalized. Um, we have uh, heard, um, you know, the high uh, liquidity um, uh, ratios uh, also uh, last night uh, mentioned by the president, this morning it was mentioned. Um, so, um, so we should not forget that. Um, to uh, to start start off with, um, it's also true, and all of us have know, of course, because of the you know the unprecedented uh, um, uh, rate hikes that we have seen that the NII has has been uh, you know uh, what it has been, um, but of course we are supervisors, so we. Um, uh, we worry. Um, uh, we are paid to worry. Uh, yesterday, Sean Bergen said that he was paid um, to uh, to be optimistic. Um, um, and so we do look at um, at asset quality. We do look at uh, at credit risk. We uh, we do wonder, just like uh, you said, um, uh, Christian, uh, whether um, you know uh, these higher um, uh, the interest rates um, uh, will in the end lead to a higher cost of risk. So, um, um, but 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 all in all, um, um, I think that you know the starting point is what, uh, what I said in the beginning. Uh, the banks uh, are resilient and um, we should not forget that in that story. Sam, just to pick up on a kind of similar question, can investors, or well, banks and their investors, look forward to a stable period of, of, of rules? So thanks, uh, thanks Patrick. Look, many investors here, you can, you can speak for yourselves, but I think Christian covered the main points. I thought Stuart also captured it well. Essentially, it comes down to a concern that current levels of profitability mm -hmm will not be sustained. I noticed that Stuart also said, effectively, that he thinks, thinks the share prices are wrong. And uh, we should attach some weight to that, given the quality of autonomous's work, but also because Stuart is exiting the stage, as far as I know, does not have a f financial interest in making <laughs> that pitch to you all. So, so I think we should note that. On, on the last of the factors, and I'm glad actually, Kristen, you put it last, probably partly be polite, but when I talk to investors, it does tend to come up last, but it is relevant. Um, Maybe I, I don't disagree with what Frank said, but I, I would just put it slightly differently in that I think people need to take one pace back. There's a fear, an, a, a, an act of fear, I think, amongst investors in back stock, bank stocks or those who might invest but are not currently investing, that the prudential regulators in Europe, Europe described broadly to include the UK, want to gobble up all the capital that there is in the banks and that they'll never see their part of the bargain. That is just flat wrong, to be honest. And I'll tell you why it is. It's for two reasons. One is that the, the really big capital we build that happens since the financial crisis, the big part of that is done. Now, we've got Basel III coming through. But you know, on any implementation of that, that is a relatively small thing compared to what we did in the last 10 years. And I think people have lost a bit of perspective about that debate and the relative size of any changes that will come through in any implementation of that package compared to what we did in the last 10 years. I think that point is a bit uh, missed. Secondly, that as prudential supervisors, it's, it's not our job 
to, to find the business models of banks or to be chasing their profitability. That would be very odd. But we have an interest in banks being able to earn a decent return um, for the obvious reasons that that helps command confidence in the business model and makes it easier for them to generate their own capital. So it's not a one-sided thing. I think investors sometimes think there's the regulator bit and they gobble all that mm-hmm. and there's our bit. Actually, it's not quite like that. The investors should know that we have an interest in uh, bank stocks being being investable. So I, I do actually think that you know the really big reform period on bank capital is done. Nothing's ever static, as Frank says. And of course, there are also new things. But um, I'm not anticipating that that level of reform it just simply will not carry on at the same pace it's been for the last 10 years. Yes. Well, I'm sure that'll be a great relief to many people. But um, what about another aspect of um, uh, things that are, that are holding back uh, European banks? Uh, I think it was touched on again in, in the previous panel very briefly, the, the scale of banks uh, here. You know, if you, if you go back to pre-2008, um, the biggest European banks were kind of the same size as the big American banks. And now, you know, the, the, the kind of factor of 10 differential. Um, one of the things that could obviously help change that is if the European market became more of a single market. Um, and I just wondered, Thomas, if you, if you wanted to address that point of, how, you know, we, again, kind of uh, banking union and single deposit scheme and so on are, uh, are um, vexed topics. People, uh, uh, a lot of pessimism about whether it, there can be any progress uh, here, but you're a believer. <laughs> Is that fair? <laughs> well, well, thanks, Patrick. Uh, so Sean Berrigan is paid to be optimistic. Uh, Frank is paid to worry. <laughs> I, I'm not paid to do, be anything particular at all, so I'm just going to tell you how I see the, 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 <laughs> yeah. the, the, the banking union. And, and, and if you allow me, I'll, I'll, I'll say a few words about the capital markets union. And, and so yeah, we go. So uh, that, yeah. starting with the banking union. So it, it's, it's been said by, me, by many over these two, year, uh, two, two days that, uh, that we've actually made remarkable progress with, uh, with the banking union and, and, and uh, Andrea is a living proof of that and as is the, 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 the relative stability that we've seen around us uh, over the last few years. And uh, that is something to behold, but on the other hand, it's, it's also, there's a flip side to that coin and that is that the, <laughs> that the, the existential pressure that, that, that gets on the political momentum have, has more, more or less run its course. So there is, there is uh, very little political capital invested nowadays to, to, to do anything that is difficult to sell domestically. This is the, the, the challenge we are, we, we, we are facing. We did not, did not uh, let a good crisis to go waste, definitely not, but that's behind us. And that's a pity, and that's, that's, that's much of the reason why the CMDI is making so uh, painful little slow p- progress in, uh, in, in the legislative work. I hope it, it, it nevertheless makes it over the finish line. Everything else is more or less in abeyance right now, waiting for that file to, to come out at the other end. But then th- there is one part of the, 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 the work uh, ahead of us that I, I need to emphasize. I, I think we need to push uh, ahead with whether there's political momentum or not, and that is uh, that is the issue of liquidity, which has popped up so many times during these uh, these these two days. And uh, I mean, when when the BRRD was 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 negotiated almost exactly ten years ago, I mean the, that that was when the the big big push was ongoing. Uh, that debate was framed in the context of what has just, uh, had just happened in, in, in the global financial crisis and, and the model of bank failures that we had seen. And, and I mean, even though at that point people did realize there was a liquidity aspect to things, the idea that there would be a bank that fails uh, purely because of liquidity issues was considered kind of nice theoretical but completely unrealistic uh, prospect. So the outcome was a, was a legislation that didn't really uh, differentiate between liquidity and, uh, and, 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 and solvency. And, and the, the, the outcome of 
so the result of this we are seeing right now, we, we clearly don't have the, the machinery to, to respond the way, the, say, the, the American authorities responded this spring. Or the, uh, the, the, the Swiss authorities, I don't see uh, the Swiss authorities right now. But anyway, you, 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 uh, the, the, this sort of triangle between central bank, fiscal authorities and regulators, we don't have a structure for that to work. We need to, we need to, 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 to do more on that and, and, and try to create more predictable framework to, to act, act quickly. That is, that is um, something we, we, uh, I, I would put as, as a first order item. I move on to, to capital markets, you know, which is uh, quite a, a, a different kind of story. There's endless political love towards that, uh, that, that project. There's not a single politician who doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, declare devotion to, to the capital markets union. Now, 80 years uh, since we started work, uh, work, working on it, uh, I mean, I, I, th I think there's a bit of a cynical view on it. I think we've made more progress than we, uh, than we care to admit, but clearly we are still at, 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 at the start <coughs> of the project. But the problem here is that we, we kind of keep miss representing it, misframing the whole issue. It's, so, so many times it's thought, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about you guys, I'm talking about the political circles. It's, it's thought in the same mind frame as, as, uh, as say, the, the, the single market, goods and, and services in the 80s, uh, that it's just about uh, removing, removing a few regulatory barriers, the opening of the floodgates, and, 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 and the, the demand will be there. That's not really what the issue is. We have uh, uh, capital movement is free. It's, it's just the, the, the question is that uh, there are all kinds of little uh, complexities and uh, annoyances. Uh, lack of, I mean, starting with the fact that many of Europe, many European countries don't have anything to that, that we, you could call capital markets. So what do you integrate then? But I mean, it's 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 uh, it's a very complex. Uh, project of, 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 of little things to nurture uh, the, the, the um, uh, sort of culture. Uh, uh, I mean, in the previous panel, it was mentioned to, that, that we need to work on, 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 on the investor side, which is very much true, but it's not a small ask uh, to, 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 to create pension funds in terms in, 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 in place of, uh, of, of the, the primarily pillar one pay as you go systems we have. It's a fundamental change in societal structures, which is kind of uh, something that characterizes all the big ticket items uh, that, that we can think of. It. It's, it's, uh, it's the, the, the pension system, the taxation, insolvency. Uh, I mean, all these create kind of obstacles to, to capital markets union, but these are not things that have been uh, set in place with capital markets in mind. They are not protectionist things. They are deep societal structures. And yes, we can work on them, but don't expect uh, quick revolutions. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm finishing here. My, my, my sort of point here is that we are making progress with capital markets union, but it's not going to, uh, and, 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 and we need political pressure, we need commitment, but don't expect uh, the future to look considerably different from the past in that respect. It's going to remain a grind. It's, it's going to be a, a, a very fragmented effort working on, on many different files, uh, but it's moving. And, and I, 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 I'm, I'm quite uh, convinced that we will uh, be making uh, progress over the coming years. Irena, uh, thank you for that. Irena, you, you made a passionate intervention in the last panel uh, uh, in support of Banking Union, and I guess maybe CMU as well. Uh, is, is something you believe in. Uh, are these the keys to enlarging the potential for, for European banking, do you think? I, I do believe so. And I, 
And I, I, I wish we could have a conversation with uh, uh, Mr. Moustier on that, uh, that uh, you know, because no, because really uh, the, the, the fact that I do see the advantages, I do see the opportunities um, in terms of, as Professor Carletti said, uh, attracting investors uh, that uh, would be much more reassured uh, about a real uh, single market with clear rules, uh, with uh, you know, a more stable environment less uh, fragmented uh, one. Um, I also do see the synergies. I mean, uh, it's not true that there are two differences. The, the single market will help smoothing out the differences. I mean, in the United States, it's not that there are not the differences. I don't think that Alabama's market is the same as Massachusetts market in terms of mortgages or, you know, <laughs> whatever you, <laughs> you want to see. So I do see the differences. I do see the ch challenges. But I see also this as an opportunity to smooth out the differences, to manage those differences in a way that is more favorable to increase uh, the attractiveness of the uh, sector, to, uh, to attract the investors, um, and, 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 and also, you know, this kind of synergy they emerge. They're not given and set in stones. They can emerge. They can be built by good strategic management. They are created by technologies. Uh, I mean, new technologies are actually creating tons of new opportunities for synergies uh, across the European Union. I mean, look, look at what happened. You know, we complain about the fintech. What, would they, what did they do? They did this. They saw opportunities to scale up things, maybe leveraging uh, <coughs> smaller markets at the, at the local national level, markets that were considered low value things or marginal things at the national level, but they managed to find a way to create a scale up and, and, and going cross border and then create an opportunity for uh, changing and revolutionize the, the industries. I mean, m markets are changing, technologies are changing. And uh, in this respect, if I, uh, if I may, you know, yes, it, it's true that we may not expect big revolutions in terms of regulatory or rules or, you know, capital markets because we know how difficult it is and, you know, the political. So it might be slow and no revolutionary. But this is one part. I mean, there is a whole real world outside our regulatory environment, which will go ahead anyway, no matter what. And revolutions may happen everywhere, are happening. They are happening in digital, they are happening in climate, they are happening. I mean, whether we, we, we like it or not. And so I, I think that's our job is also to use the tools that we have available that we can build together to make sure that we are prepared for these changes and we don't always come when it's too late. And on this regard, if I can, if I may, just uh, go back a little bit to your first questions about having uh, uh, stable uh, rules. You sort of said we need yes. stable rules, yes. stable regulations. So as a, as a policymaker, I, I feel a lot about this. And of course, it's important to have, a, but more than stable rules, what I would uh, uh, advocate for is uh, more predictable and democratically discussed rules in the sense that, not stable in the sense that you don't change them, but in the sense that you change them in a way that involves all the actors, that is capable of uh, seeing the problems that we want to address with the rules and work together, because we also have to agree what rules are for. So the way the bank tax, for example, happened in Italy would be the opposite of exactly. the way you would like to I see agree. It. Even I Even totally if there was going to be a tax, it needs to be discussed and not sprung on people at that's 7 o'clock exactly on a Friday what night. I meant. Yeah. Just to give yeah. an example, but it's not the only one. No, no, no. So, and, uh, so that does not mean that uh, it's uh, forbidden to think about a tool like that. Sure. It may well become a possible tool, but we discuss together what are the tools, which directions, which are the objectives. Yes. You know, how, is it sustainable? What are the impacts? This is, I think, the principle. And, uh, but we have to agree what rules are for. So rules are something that uh, only comes later to repair what is broken, yeah. or it's something that allow us to prevent problems and to accompany change in a way that when it comes about, it's not so disruptive and we are prepared. It's a really good point. So Frank and Christian both wanted to come on. on. Thank you. You know, this is a panel about the future. And sometimes I have a feeling that we are making ourselves too small. 
that we forget. And yesterday we had, um, you know, a, a inspiring figure of a future, of a, a former generation who is still now um, teaching us. There were people that created the single market. There were people that created the single euro. There were people that created the single supervisory mechanism. They stood up and they, something, they did something that many people in these audiences then said would never work, would never come about. And if it came, would certainly fail. Yeah. It didn't fail. Mm. Here it is, the single supervisory mechanism, the single currency, the single market. Many of these steps that we Europeans have taken over the many decades were taken because we looked back and we said that disaster we should avoid forever. Can we for once do the right things and the big things looking forward, which is the theme of this panel, and say we need to do a couple of things to avoid something? Our president has given many speeches, I guess also in this room, where he says, you know, did, and, and, and then I stop here, but um, for now. And <laughs> we need the capital markets union for many reasons, but we also, we can never do the green transition without the capital markets union. Mm. We, we, we throw this number at each other, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's so big that nobody, but you know, every year today, we need 500 billion plus additional investment for the green transition. We are not even close to that. Yeah, that's a good point. We should, and so, so we need to convince ourselves that we need to go back to that spirit of doing grand things in a grand way, mm. or we will be facing a very, very um, dire future. Christian, I'm guessing you would agree with that. Yes, and, 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 and Frank took uh, half of my comment uh, because um, I, I, I really wanted to make clear we will never ever make the Green Deal without the Capital Markets Union. Impossible. It's a 500 billion. Think about how long Germany, I'm not talking about the 60 billion, how long Germany debated about the extra budget of 100 billion for defense 18 months ago. We need 500 billion a year until the 2045 to be financed. It cannot be done by balance sheets of the banks, cannot be done by state budget, so we need that. What I'm missing in this um, discussion, and I agree, by the way, it will most likely take some years. I'm not a politician, I'm, I'm not an expert there, but this is a base case expectation. There are items we can do in the interim. There are proposals on the table on secretarizations. That would already help to free up the balance sheets of the banks. And we have now these days, in my view, again, a completely different risk underwriting than we had in 2008. We did a lot of things wrong. Mm. And I think we, we learned our lesson. But let's make sure that also on secretarizations, we now walk the next steps. And, and this is what we need to do. And, and, and says, what can we do in order to take the bridging steps to Capital Markets Union? in order to free up balance sheet to finance this transformation. Last point, I think we banks need to do a better job. I really do believe that the people out there, if you leave this building and you go down into the Frankfurt Street and you ask people about the Capital Markets Union, 50% of the people don't know what it is. Secondly, the other 50% are may thinking this is just in order to boost profits, uh, profits for the banks, increase the variable comp, or pay dividends. At the end of the day, we haven't done a good job, and it starts with us in the bank. I'm talking about this in the EBF, that we need to explain that at the end of the day, it's nothing else than the economic booster for the European Union and for our corporates. And we need to do a better job to explain to the society why this is necessary. And I think if we get this done, it will be far easier also for the politicians in the parliament to agree on the one or the other steps. And therefore, I'm thinking it's a joint task. And we as EBF and single banks need to do a better job in order to explain why this is so essential for the European Union. That's an extremely important point. Um, I just wanted to change. Uh, oh, yeah, please, yeah. if you want to finish off on this. Right. So, so just to, to, to uh, touch upon what, what, uh, what Frank said, uh, I, 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 thought, I don't think 
Capital Markets Union is, is, is one of those cases where there are naysayers and then there's a political will that overcomes mm -hmm. that, that, that. I mean, there's, there's no one who says that uh, Capital Markets Union cannot work or it, it shouldn't happen, it cannot be done. That's not really the point. The point is that it's quite difficult to figure out what are the bits and pieces that, that need to be done. Securitization, I think that's probably one where uh, there is, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call it a, a agreement, but sort of a, a, a clearest interest, the clearest uh, sort of a, a qualitative understanding that there are things to be done. If you, if you then go to, to insolvency, uh, which I, I mean, I, it, it is a, a big issue in, in terms of, of, of uh, the, the, the uh, difficulties in changing it because it links with uh, uh, property rights and company laws and, and, and things like that. But w when you start to dig up, what is, what is it exactly that you need to do there? And what would be the effect on, 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 on capital markets union? It's not that easy to say. Irene pointed out that, that uh, I mean, uh, insolvency law is not uh, harmonized in the United States. Still, there is a, a capital markets union. So uh, there is a sort of, uh, in every field, uh, there are sort of uh, lack of analytical clarity of what actually needs to be done. We have this general understanding that it will, would be helpful if we do, uh, do, do this. But, but in, in terms of coming up with a good plan of, of where the bang for the buck is, is, is good is actually quite difficult. But I do agree with Irene uh, fully that, that the world is going on while we speak here. And, exactly. and, and that actually may create channels for, 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 for creating capital markets union outside of the, the, the efforts that we are, we are doing here. And I, 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 I hope it, it, it uh, keeps happening. Okay, that, that's, that's been a really important discussion about uh, about the kind of scaling of the market, if you like. I, I wanted to change tack and bring Sam in on um, something that Michael Barr raised in his um, address earlier, which was um, the liquidity regime. Uh, and, and a couple of you have, have mentioned uh, liquidity rules as they stand now. Um, how much do you think the liquidity rules need to change in order to guard against a repeat of the types of events we saw in the US regional banks and also at Credit Suisse? Uh, thanks, uh, Patrick. Look, the starting point is that the, the rules that we set have never been designed to prevent a total run from bringing down a bank. Uh, and I think Michael was making that point too. I think it was 85% Silicon Valley's deposits went out in two days. We're never going to calibrate the regime there. That would be tantamount to moving to narrow banking. Mm -hmm. So it's about what's a reasonable amount of kind of self-insurance to have in the system. And then I think the second piece where I'm, I'm very much in the same place as Michael is about how disciplined are we about making sure that in addition to that, banks are in a position to draw down quickly on central bank facilities when needed. Because there are, there are good reasons to doubt, as Michael was saying, that the speed with which even quite high quality assets can be monetized in the market by a bank that's obviously in trouble, um, that those assumptions are quite right. So I think we need to bring together the sort of central banking preposition piece with the regulatory LCR piece and have a more disciplined view across the two of them. Now, we've always pushed banks on this in supervision um, at the PRA, but I would say that the, way, the join between those two things has not been as strong as it should be. And some of that's because of, you know, sort of technical issues like the fact that some of what is in the HQLA bucket will sometimes be part of what's preposition collateral. It's just a bit tricky for people to work out. So I think there's a job to do to look at, you know, does the LCR need any recalibration in view of what we learned? That's a good question to ask. But in addition to that, how do we make the uh, preposition side work better? And if I might just have one other point, if we want to come back to this, Patrick, but it's interesting because at, at the other end of the pipe, uh, we're going into an environment where the quantity of bank reserves in all of the main systems will be reducing. And that, of course, is the most liquid asset that we have. And from a, from a supervisor's point of view, reserves are nice because it cuts through all of these issues. Um, but there's going to be something about sort of coming up from the bottom, what do we need uh, in terms of your first question? At the same time, we're coming down from the top in terms of the volume of reserves there is in the system. Somewhere between those two things, there's going to be a meeting point. 
So that addresses the Stuart's um, point that he said again, investors complain about the minimum reserve re requirement rules uh, in this part of the world. Uh, well, you're saying it's kind of merited, really. I mean, the record should show that Sam Woods <laughs> did not offer, not offer any comment whatsoever on the business of the ECB, and particularly the MRR. Um, uh, but However. It, but it is, it is, it is, it, I think it's going to be an important discussion in all the major jurisdictions over the next year or two about, you know, as, as QT comes through, and there are also some local funding schemes being withdrawn. For instance, we have one in the UK called TFSME. Um, that's going to be quite a big change in funding conditions for banks at the same time as we're thinking about your first question. And I think we can navigate that, but it, it's complex. Okay. Christian, I just wanted to bring you in on, on this point about, you know, LCR being self-insurance, essentially. Uh, normally, self-insurance programs are um, designed by, well, or at least thought about by the people who are doing the self-insurance as well as by maybe the, the supervisory authorities. In running your bank sensibly, what do you think is the right kind of, you know, the 30 day kind of time frame that the LCR demands versus the two days that Silicon Valley Bank kind of blew up in? What, what's, the, what's the right kind of time frame to be thinking about in the modern world? To be honest, it's, I, I, let me start a little bit different on this because everybody in the room knows that, that we were attacked at the end of March and, and we had a two to or three day event. Um, yep. and, and therefore, I, I really do believe that overall the liquidity rules which we have employed, in particular also here in Europe, because I can best judge on those, are to be honest the right ones. Okay. And, and, and I have to say, um, you know, we have often different views, but, but I think um, the reaction of the ECB um, to the situation which we have seen on the regional banks in the, in the US or with Credit Suisse in Switzerland, I really have to praise you because there was no knee-jerk reaction. And I think what is very important is that the regulator at the end of the day is looking at the individual banks because if you really look at our situation end of March, at the end of the day we started with approximately 620 billion of deposits. We went down to 595 billion. Now don't quote me on the last billion, but we went down. The real deposits which we lost through the seven or eight days were approximately 10 to 12 billion from wealth management, and multinational clients actually in Asia. Mm. The most sticky part was the retail and mid-cap and small business deposits, which are approximately in our bank 450 billion in Germany and in Europe. And I think that the, the most important is if you think about LCR, it's not only about the ratio, and of course we have to comply with that. And I think we, we have overall the right ratios, but is that the regulator and the banks in such a situation understand the individual, individual situation of a bank and can say how sticky or not sticky deposits are. Mm -hmm. and therefore, I'm always saying when it comes to the crisis in, in March, if you have these four things right, adequate capital level, adequate liquidity measured by LCR or absolute amount of liquidity, but in particular that link to a broad and diversified deposit base, and then you are sustainable, profitable, then you can address you can address that challenge. And in this regard, I think it's more an individual assessment of the regulator to the bank in which shape it is there. And in this regard, I have to say, um, I wouldn't call for action and I, I have to applaud because there was no knee-jerk reaction. And I have to say, we bankers were nervous that this is coming. Yes. If, if anybody else wants to come in on this point of liquidity, then yeah, please. Yeah, maybe maybe just to, to point what, what, what Sam already started, that. LCR is is, is 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 probably not the answer to 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 the kind of situations that we're faced in 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 the spring. Mm. It, it that 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 comes to the issue of of, of land of last resorts and 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 what I tried to to spell out in my in my opening remarks that that that's uh, uh, we need to design a system where it's clear where the central bank responsibilities and 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 the, the the resolution authority responsibilities starts and then on the way back where the central bank uh, responsibilities resume after the resolution and and and, and we don't really have that uh, uh, that 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 a proper framework for that in place and I, I think we need to 
to to to do some uh, some work on that. Okay, let's get to Frank. What I would like to add uh, to this part of the discussion is that, of course, when something goes wrong, and and by the way, I think that the European banks, um, you know, um, sailed well through the uh, the March uh, turmoil. Um, uh, but the immediate reaction many times is to ask, so do we need new regulation, different rules, etc. But I think a main um, lesson that um, we can draw, and you can see this in, I think, an excellent uh, SVB report uh, that was done in the US. Uh, you can see that in the evaluation of the, uh, you know, of the, uh, the events in Switzerland, is supervision. And, um, and, and today, uh, we are here also uh, to talk about, um, you know, five year of uh, Andreas' uh, chairmanship of, uh, of the SSM. And, and I think if you look at these various reports, and by the way, also, although this was completely unrelated to any kind of crisis, but the, um, the, the vice president's report that, 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 that you uh, asked for and that we got, um, the lessons that, that I think can be drawn there is that in a world that is changing faster, um, we cannot be complacent as supervisors uh, and as banks, by the way. We need to become better at um, remedying findings. If we see something that is just not okay, uh, it cannot just sit there uh, and year after year, you know, we, uh, we, we embellish our analysis and we share with the banks that we are still concerned and there time goes on. We need to have a culture of um, effectiveness, of impact, of um, um, supervision that maybe doesn't go like this, <laughs> but maybe goes like this. Things need to um, be remedied because the world is changing fast. So um, one of the lessons that we draw from this, um, and again, this was something we had already put in motion, so maybe I should more say that we were reconfirmed in the road that we had already uh, embraced, is that we had a very close look again to all the instruments that the legislator has given us. Um, I mean, there is a whole list of things that we can do um, that go beyond um, you know, capital requirements. Um, uh, we can send deadlines, we can, um, um, uh, we can restrict businesses, uh, we can set deadlines and say if by that deadline you haven't done so, there is actually a periodic penalty payment. So we have looked again at our full toolkit and we have looked each other in the eyes in the supervisory board and said we are going to be using this. Of course, and this is the lawyer speaking, in a proportional way, we will always prefer to have a real conversation and to convince uh, a bank of the, the right uh, way to go if we feel that there is a certain risk that, that need to be remedied. Um, but if then um, uh, things don't change for the better, we will uh, be scaling up. And I think this is one of the, um, uh, the clear uh, learnings um, uh, of uh, you know, the recent past. I want to move on and, and talk about um, uh, a subject that is uh, that goes beyond banking. Uh, that uh, is probably the, the thing that corporates around the world are the most excited about, and maybe authorities are the most fearful of AI. Um, Irena, I wonder if maybe I could start with you. Um, from 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 your point of view, do you see AI as a great opportunity? or as a great threat? It's both. For banks. Uh, it's both. I mean, yeah. it, it, it can be, can be a, it is a great opportunity. Of course, yeah. there can be also a threat depending on how you, um, you face it, how you prepare for it, how you, it, it's like all new, as I was saying, sometimes from time to time you have these revolutionary changes mm. And, uh, and and you can't just uh, avoid it. I mean, so as a legislator, how do you kind of uh, well? Deal with the, that? The, the debate is still uh, uh, ongoing. So yes. we are, as always, when you have to regulate something, uh, to legislate on something that is uh, new, you have you have to be very careful in trying to not over. Uh, overdo it. <laughs> so yeah. we, we tend to always have a sort of a gradual approach like we did with uh, Mika, for example. So we try to, to do it on uh, with respect to cryptos and everything. So you have to be prepared to start laying the ground and, uh, and give also the time to uh, adapt 
uh, to, this, uh, to these changes, to capture the opportunities, but at the same time trying to ne neutralize the threats. Uh, the thing is that, in my opinion, with AI, but the same with cryptos, the same with uh, you know, all these innovations, we need to work together, I believe, uh, in a way being very realistic and very pragmatic about what is going to happen and not in a defensive way, um, which is sometimes I've seen as an approach. Some, uh, politicians sometimes are defensive because they want to, to show their strength and over-regulate to, to tell their constituency they, are, uh, they have everything under control. Uh, the industry sometimes is defensive in saying we need to block this innovation or we need to protect ourselves. If you don't do this, uh, we will be destroyed. So if we start... And when we're competing with the US and China, let's say, in this particular area, do you think this is a particularly European problem that we <laughs> worry here about what could go wrong before we worry about what could go right? No, I, I think that, uh, you know, every cons I, I don't want to judge what others are doing. I, I'm saying that, uh, for example, we, we saw in the spring that uh, our concerns and the system that we have built uh, made us more resilient and uh, allowed uh, our banks to be resilient and to our, our citizens to be protected. Uh, so uh, I think we also have to acknowledge that and uh, we have some specificities <coughs> and we are trying to, uh, to do that. Actually, I see in many fields where we moved uh, uh, earlier uh, that other uh, constituencies, other, um, uh, they are looking at us, actually, and we are setting standards. And frankly, I, I prefer being a, a standard setter rather than <laughs> to passively uh, be the one that uh, run after what others are, are, are building. So we do it gradually, you know, like, like two years ago or last year when we, we, were this, we had this mission in, in, in DC and many of our colleagues in the Congress were very interested in what we had managed to do with uh, Mika for it for instance. Yeah. So we had a lot of interesting uh, uh, debates and discussions and I think that was a good uh, first step. It's gradual. Of course, we have lots of people that complain that's not enough. Uh, for someone, it's too much. But this is, uh, of course, the, the, always the, the risk of what we, of what we do. But uh, I think that uh, by moving together, so regulators, policymakers, and industry identifying what are the trends, what are we going for, and trying to anticipate both the threats and the opportunities, we can uh, give ourselves a better environment uh, to, you know, to embrace the change and not be threatened, to neutralize the threats and take the opportunities. But uh, we, th th we need also to lower our defensive, instinctively <laughs> defensive uh, okay. approach. Yeah, and Sam, do you? Well, yeah, I'm glad to, glad to hear Rena's tone, which I think is is very sensible. Obviously, the, the development of generative AI is a massive breakthrough. Um, and you know, unusually, of course, it has one manifestation with the large language models where we can all immediately feel how big a breakthrough it is. I remember the, the time, quite a long time ago now, actually, that our team asked uh, one of the, uh, one of the gen uh, generative models to describe our MREL policy uh, in the style of a pirate. And uh, the response was just fantastic. I think it might have also been the first time I truly understood our policy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, would, would you like to yeah. do an impression? Yeah. Uh, no, I can't, I'm not uh, going to do my pirate impression. Oh, thanks, come on. Thanks for, thanks for attempting. <laughs> later on this evening. Later on this yeah, evening, yeah. I, will, I will offer that. Um, but the serious point I want to make was this, that um, uh, I am gently sceptical about the idea that we need a lot of financial services-specific AI regulation. Mm. Uh, there is, I'm sure, a place for wider AI regulation, mm. but we've looked very carefully at our regulation. We've tried always to be technology agnostic. Um, it is true that the banks and the insurers are asking us to elaborate a little bit here and there. So what are reasonable steps if you're a senior manager who's got responsibility for one of these models? And OK, I think we can do a bit of that. But I sat where I'm sat at the moment. My instinct is not that we need a kind of big extra financial services AI regulation layer. There may have to be something up here. We may need to do some little elaborations here, but that, I think if we if we if we do this, we're going to have this in here. We're going to have this in energy. We're going to have this in health. I think it'll be a mess. Christian, as a practitioner, uh, are you encouraged by the tone you're hearing from the? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I, mean, uh, uh, I think, uh, in particular, what, what Sam just said is, is, is absolutely true. And let me to your question: opportunity or threat? Yes. In my view, it's an absolute must-do. Yeah. Forget even opportunity or threat. Yeah. If you if you are not there, you're gone. Yeah. Um, and, and 
I even start, forget about as a bank. Look at the demographic development in Germany, in, the, in most of the Western part of this world. Without AI, we will not be able actually to replace all that. What is sort of say, um, from, from a pension and aging point of view, yes. going into a certain direction. So we should really embrace it. From a, from a bank's point of view, you know, it, it helps us on all three topics. Um, for sure, revenues. Why revenues? Because it's a client experience which is far better than the old part. Think about the call centers which we have in the private bank. I can tell you by heart the 10 most questions which I ask from Friday, from Monday to Friday, and, 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 and just the level of preciseness, responsiveness, no waiting time on the call, you can actually increase the client experience, which always has a positive impact on your bottom line or on your top line. Cost, I don't need to argue that. But I think, and there we need to have the good discussion also with the regulators, and I understand that we need deep discussions. We are running a lot of test runs in AFC, in KYC, with AI, and our results are actually very, very encouraging. Mm. Now, I, I understand that this needs to be done together with regulators, but I think the control areas and the control levels of banks can be even increased if you apply it to the right standards. Mm. Interesting. Um, just before I come to the kind of policy makers for, for a reaction to that point, um, you just want to tell us something that you're, I mean, you mentioned call center um, kind of servicing and stuff, but something really exciting that you think AI exciting could change. Is, exciting is, uh, look, David Volker's Lando uh, may not like to hear it, but, uh, but it was actually his idea. Mm. We are now putting AI in Deutsche Bank research to go through the research reports. What today are kind of the analysts, the young analysts are doing, the way AI can actually scan through all these reports, think about the conclusions. We are trying to think about how can we then make the result, not that there is no human being anymore involved, but to actually come up with a structure, come up with a comprehensive summary, come up with a faster response to our clients. It's an exciting, it's a real exciting uh, project. AI in human resources. You can't believe how happy people are if they call, our own people call actually the human resources hotline and they get more precise and clear answers to questions they have than before. So it's not only client related or investor related, it is also the way you run the bank. Yes. Irene, you wanted to come back? No, if I if I may, uh, of course, uh, there are tons of opportunities for you know, banks for profitability, new markets, more efficient management, etc. But a as a policymaker, I have also to ask myself other questions. And I'll give you just a couple of examples. Um, I'm often approached by, uh, not only by bankers, but also by citizens, um, entrepreneurs, small and medium business firms that, are, uh, that have problems in relating with banks, you know, when they're in accessing to uh, mortgages or loans or so they, they come to me. And for example, uh, recently I had uh, um, women's organizations and women entrepreneurs uh, coming to me and reporting me problems that they've had in accessing uh, uh, credit uh, from banks uh, they were small, very, very small uh, entrepreneurs with uh, three, four employees at the very beginning. And one had uh, denied, and she saw that uh, the, the bank denied uh, access to credit because it said, you are uh, in your 30s. What happens if you get pregnant next year? Will you be able to repay? Mm. Okay? These things happen. Mm. Okay? We may be shocked. We may say, oh my God, this is terrible. But they are happening. Mm. Okay? So what happens if... Things like that get inside the algorithms of the AI, when we, uh, AI, mm. when we have to decide who to give credit to or not. Mm. What happens to that? As a policymaker, I feel my duty, my responsibility to make sure that this is not happening. Yes. Because my prior objective is not yours, is not making the bank profitable, but is to make the European Union the union that I want to have in terms of value, in terms of protection of the citizens, of women's rights, of everything. So, and I'll give you another example. I had uh, uh, associations, like business associations, LGBTQ+, they were worried about uh, the implications of AI, for example, in insurance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because what happens if we uh, end up being labeled as riskier for some aspects? There are lots of prejudices. Mm. 
this could happen. How do we know that AI is not becoming an instrument that ends up deviating us from the European Union that we want to build for our citizens, for our entrepreneurs, for minorities? So I think these are questions that I understand you might not be so much worried about, but it's my duty as a policymaker to worry about these things. And so this is the kind of debate that we have in Parliament when we talk about AI, just yes. to you know, yeah, provide no, some examples. Okay. That's really, really interesting. Do you want to come back very quickly, Christian? On, no, on no, no, no. I, I think, you know, I, I just said, in particular, when it comes to controls, but others, we need to work with the regulators and the policymakers. But, you know, the world, as we said for another topic, the world moves on. I was just in China. I was in the US. The application of AI over there is dramatically higher than in Europe. And we see where the investments are going. Capital markets share in Europe versus US was 20% 15 years ago. We are now at 9%. So we have, we need to see that this is happening. This doesn't mean that we need to be, not need to be cautious about that. So I agree there. Yeah, yeah. The move. Uh, yeah, come, come in with a, with a, a final yeah, I mean, I, I just, it seems to me that it is not in the interest of, of, of Deutsche Bank or any bank to create a, an AI system that discriminates uh, yeah. uh, no. customers. Uh, it's not good business. And, 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 and I, I, I would think that the incentives are there for Christian to worry about this sufficiently, that, that it doesn't happen. So, uh, uh, then there are things of, of risk management that may arise from this that I'm sure Frank and Sam will be eager to think about. And uh, at this point, I... And, and apart from the, the issues of existential threats from AI, which are sort of general of nature, not in, in our field specific, I at this point don't really see yet. Uh, I mean, I, 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 need, I think we need, uh, we, 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 we are far too early to form a picture of whether there are some sector specific regulations that are needed uh, in, in this field. So far, I'm, I, I've, I've, uh, I've not seen any. Okay. Great. Um, I'm conscious that there would be uh, questions from the audience. I'm very keen to uh, involve you. I'll come to uh, you. Do prepare your questions in your heads. Uh, I've got one that I wanted to put to um, Frank and Sam, actually, f from uh, uh, an online question. Um, and it's to do with climate, Frank, because I, I know you're, this is an area you're very interested in. Um, do you think... It's realist, and sorry, it's a, it's a slightly techy question, uh, but uh, all, the, all the more important for that. Do you think it's realistic to include climate-related and sustainability factors in estimates for probability of default and loss-given default calculations? And if so, how could it be done? All right, well, thanks for the question. I thought, you know, when is this question going to come now, finally? But here it is. Um, <laughs> what I normally do when I get a pretty technical question to also make sure that it's palatable for everyone in the room is to maybe just zoom out a little bit and remind me of a, the, all of us of a couple of things. So we talked a lot about regulation. There is um, a European climate law uh, that um, there is a fit for 55 um, 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 uh, strategy. There is a green deal. Um, there was a Paris agreement almost 10 years ago. Um, the climate law says 55% um, uh, reduction of CO2 um, um, by 2030. Um, the Paris Agreement, as we know, says as close as possible to one and a half, but under two. We are today on a three degree scenario worldwide, and um, the predictions for CO2 emissions by 230 are worldwide are not minus 20, uh, minus 55, minus 45 or zero, but plus 8.2 percent. That's where we are today. Um, now we, and I'm going to state this with so much emphasis that I'm just going to say it twice. This is how I normally do this. We, as a supervisor and as a central bank, we don't make climate policies. We don't make climate policies. We take them. So we look at the Paris Agreement, we look at the climate, uh, the, the climate law, uh, and we see that these create risks, transition risks. And we look out of the window and we see that there's a whole bunch of physical risks. And I don't need to mention those. That's what we do. So we don't make climate policy. We do what we have always done. And that is we make sure that banks manage their material risks. And we now know 
not all the banks still. So I'll come back to that in a second. But we now know that climate-related risk, and by the way, also nature-related risk, are material. So they need to be managed. So what do we do to help the banks to get to doing that well and adequately? We have a multi-year strategy because this cannot be done in a couple of days, logically. So we published a guide already in 2020 with our supervisory expectations in terms of uh, managing, again, risk, climate and environmental related risks. Then we asked the banks in 2021 to do self-assessments. And the banks have been um, commendably sincere because they came back to us and they said, well, you know, we do not comply with these expectations as of yet, um, which I thought was completely logical. So we asked, how much time do you need? And then 80% of the banks under our supervision said, you know, give and take, give, give us to the end of 24 and we will get this done. We will be able to comply fully with all your expectations in your guide of 2020. So then we thought, you know what, if that is what 80% of the banks feel that they can do, we will create a level playing field and we will make sure that all banks do this and we will not have any hold out banks, uh, etc. So then we embarked on a thematic review, which normally we take, you know, a sample of our banks. But here, because we felt that this was one of our key priorities, we asked all the banks. Um, we went to all the banks uh, and we checked. Um, this was in 22. We did a bottom up um, stress test. We did a number of um, on site missions. We have done um, and we have published also crucially um, good practices. Because the good news is that already um, one and a half years ago, uh, all of our expectations, at least, um, there was at least one bank, um, and, and these banks have been in different jurisdictions, different sizes, different business models, that complied with one of these expectations. So all of our expectations, so to say, uh, were being complied with, at least here and there, by the one or the other bank. So we knew and we know that it is possible. We just haven't found any bank yet today that complies with all these expectations um, um, uh, individually, which is okay because we have this process. Now, and here I want to tie in and then I will stop um, with what I said earlier about um, supervisory effectiveness. Um, so we said, um, we are not going to wait till the end of 24 to then in 25 check how things have gone and then maybe in 26 uh, start thinking about how do we make sure that those banks who have not been able to comply um, uh, are complying. So we set a number of interim deadlines. And we announced that um, um, years in advance in many speeches, press releases, you name it. Um, and we set uh, the first uh, deadline, uh, interim deadline for March of this year. Um, and what we asked was to do, and I'm going to be um, a little basic here now, but to do what is actually the first basic step in risk management and is do a materiality assessment. And those banks who actually did that well, they all came to the conclusion that this was material for them. What we have done uh, is those banks who did not uh, deliver that on that first uh, interim deadline. Uh, we have now started um, in this escalation ladder that I, I, I said before, uh, and um, uh, that might, but might not, uh, depending on how, um, uh, you know, in the coming period um, they will, um, uh, you know, start uh, walking faster, uh, might in the end also lead to periodic penalty payments. Um, that goes into what I said earlier. Uh, we want to be an effective supervisor. We want to be a predictable supervisor. We want to be a reasonable supervisor, but we also want to be an ambitious uh, supervisor with impact. Thank and you. so that the end uh, point of that, though, th does that translate into a risk-weighted asset calculation? In the end, um, so I haven't said anything about capital. No. Um, Which was the question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I tend to remember the questions, um, but I wanted to make so clear that this is something that banks can do. This is something that banks must do. This is something that even if there was no supervisor and if you were to just manage your risks, you have to do. And, um, uh, and I'm pretty sure that we will be able, um, and you know, there is some passion here uh, on this, but we will be able to deliver together a European banking system that is able to manage these risks. Um, now, um, to say one thing on capital, I think this is, this, is, this is not immediate at all, but it is true that, um, you know, 
our whole capital system is based on if there are certain risks, they need to be well capitalized. Yeah. Um, so from this institution, we have always been against um, green supporting factors and, and things that can, you know, that, that, that let, let go mm. of a purely risk focus. Mm. Uh, because as I have tried to underline, uh, I think rather emph emphatically, this is all about risk management. Yes. Now, to start, there is one more risk, and this goes way beyond what I've just said. And, and you will see if you look at um, you know, the scenarios that um, the NCFS, uh, the, 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 the Central Bank and Supervisor Network for the Financial System, um, uh, produces scenarios that we, uh, that we use. Um, there's a disclaimer there. And it's small, and it looks legal, but it's important for all of us. The disclaimer says that we might be underestimating seriously what is coming. And I think that we all should worry about this, not only today, but also tomorrow and in the years to come. Mm. Um, climate scientists tell us that it is not unlikely that certain tipping points have already been passed. That means that things are locked in, even if we stopped emitting today, which we are certainly not doing. We always talk about the things that are still needed to make it. So today, uh, Christian, you said banks, and governments will not be able to come up with the 500 billion. So we need a green uh, CMU. To us, you have just told us that's not going to happen. That's not what I said. <laughs> well, <laughs> Sorry. I, okay, but you said it's much more difficult. It's going to take time. Yeah. It's going to be. So is, is that going to happen to 500 billion extra investments this year? It is not. It's next year? No. The year after? No maybe 10, 15 years from now. But so this clock is ticking. Yeah. So the only thing that I'm saying to all of us, that little disclaimer there might come to haunt us. It's a really important point. Sam, anything to add from your side? And then I want to take some questions from the audience. To Thank the you. narrow question, yeah. my answer is yes, but not very well. I say that because some of our banks are already doing it mm -hmm. under pillar two for their mortgage right. exposures. But it's something that you're going to increasingly kind of... Yeah, the, it's, it's early stage, yeah. but but the, the more you know, forward thinking amongst our banks are already attempting to do those calculations for the purpose. Off their own bats. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Very good. Okay. Questions from the room. Uh, raise your hands if you would like to ask anything of any of our panelists. Have we answered every question that you might have? Surely not. Yeah. Please. Uh, there's a microphone just coming. Andreas, yeah. there's, Andreas Dormit, as nobody was asking a question, I'll ask a quick question. To what extent, and you, Patrick, you just call on whomever you would like sure. to call. Uh, looking at AI and uh, having spoken about other continents being so far ahead of us, to what extent is there the potential of a dependency coming our way and what, how much of a problem is that potentially? It's a very good question. I suppose... Uh, it's been prefigured in other sectors, for example, our uh, historic dependency on chips from certain parts of Asia, for example. Um, do you want to take that? Well, the, I mean, the other, thanks, Andreas, for question. The other good example, recent example, is cloud. Yeah. Um, and the response within the European system has been Dora. We've got a critical third party thing uh, just coming uh, forward in, in the UK. So essentially, from the financial regulator's point of view, if the parliamentarians agree, the instinct is to think if something becomes really big and really systemic, then you need a little bit to add to the basic principle of it's for the banks to manage their own suppliers. You might need a little bit extra to reach over and say, you need to play ball in our cyber stress tests. You need to be able to do X, Y, Z. So, so I think if it developed in that way, to me, it seems quite likely that, you know, that AI dependency would become part of that frame. Very good. Uh, Irene, do you want to add? No, to I don't to have much to add, except just one, one thought. When, because uh, we discussed the regulation in terms of uh, AI and everything, the fact that we are behind, but just as a reminder, the regulation is not op op 
you know, operational yet. So if we are behind, it's not because of the regulation. <laughs> so, so maybe we also sometimes have to think about why are we lagging behind? Because every time I hear we are lagging behind on innovation in banking, in fintech, in AI, and always we blame the regulation. But in, in this case, <laughs> we still <laughs> are working on it. So um, it, it, it's not our fault. The, the thing is that uh, maybe we should have also an honest conversation about uh, how come that in the European Union in general we have, but I know it's a completely different panel and a different conference, but uh, how come that in the European Union uh, sometimes we struggle in developing uh, innovation, uh, you know, uh, you know, breakthrough innovation that, that can penetrate different industries and uh, put ourselves a different tier of the innovation. I think this is a conversation that uh, it was much more fashionable in Europe like 15 years ago, uh, 20, 20 years ago. Now it's a little bit uh, under, uh, and maybe we should resume that and instead of just blaming the regulation and just work together in terms of what we could do uh, to, to spur investments, innovation, research, because we, we're not talking that much about it, but I, but we are lacking behind, not just in these in many aspects. So and so. It's a crucial point. Yeah, absolutely. We are um, nearly out of time. Um, but uh, like many panels um, before us yesterday and today, uh, I think several of us wanted to um, finish by paying homage to Andrea uh, and his uh, time at the, the, uh, the helm of the SSM. Uh, just speaking, speaking personally as a journalist, I've never come across someone who has been so uh, respected by journalists, by analysts, by uh, fellow regulators, but also by the industry. Uh, it's quite an achievement. So uh, I think um, applause from me on that. But I know, Sam, you wanted to come in and say. Uh, say thanks, Patrick. I'll say a quick word and then maybe yeah. ask Christian to, to finish. But uh, Andrea, look, everybody knows you've been a brilliant leader of the SSM, a brilliant leader of the EBA, and a totally committed European. Let me add something more personal, which is, um, as you mentioned last night, the first time we met was in 2010, um, when we were looking at the question of ring fencing in the UK. And I came away from that meeting thinking, ah, this is someone who's very wise, very wise. <laughs> I remember what you said, actually. You said at Banca d'Italia in your youth, you had some experience with uh, activity-based restrictions, and it was not a very positive experience. So, unfortunately, we did ignore that advice uh, <laughs> last time I did that. A couple of years later, I realized also that you are very courteous, because probably what you were thinking in that first meeting was, wow, this guy doesn't know very much. Uh, but that was not apparent to me at the time. And then as we've worked together since, you know, the other quality that I really admire in you is you are incredibly tough, very, very tough. Um, and I think that's a fantastic quality. Um, in a supervisor and a regulator. So I've always thought of you as, if you like, like a wise uncle to give <laughs> advice, to guide. Um, usually when you lose an uncle, it's a permanent loss. Um, but luckily in this case, it's not permanent. And indeed, you've seen the light and you're coming to London. So uh, we look forward to welcoming you there. But I'll pass to Christian. Well, um, we had already the opportunity in the EBF, but uh, I, I have to say all that was, was said before is, is really true. I, I think uh, you are a super highly respected regulator among us banks. Also, when we have the one or the other uh, situation where we had a different view, and there I can say, yes, you have been tough, um, but I think that's your task. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, I always uh, measure people when there are tense situations, Andrea. and and knowledgeable or that, of course. The way you behave when it comes to challenging and critical situation, you listen, you think, you are very clear, you are calm, but you are also pragmatic in those situations. And that we all appreciate, and therefore we always felt very safe with you. Uh, well, Andrea, we've probably embarrassed you enough. Uh, but uh, but um, on that note, uh, thank you and thank you to the panel. Uh.